the, there's this sort of uh, eternal tension, you know, between um, one between desiring equality between the sexes and accept and and acknowledging the difference, the physiological differences between the sexes. And I think that you know, I mean, that tension is not one that you can abolish, even though you know recent activists are definitely trying. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is a writer for Unheard. Mary Harrington, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on. Francis and I have both reading many of your articles recently and really enjoying your work from a kind of independent thinking person's perspective, which is really, really cool. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, uh, tell everybody a little bit about your background. What has been your journey through life? How do you find yourself sitting here talking to us? Um, well, I fell into writing completely by accident. Well, not completely by accident, but mostly by accident about 18 months ago. I mean, I left, uni I, I read English literature at university and like most English undergrads, wanted to become a writer when I grew up. Um, spent my 20s writing completely unreadable garbage. Um, <laughs> eventually came to the conclusion that actually, no, I was, I was going to park that because I didn't really have anything to say that anybody wanted to hear. And I should probably go off and do some stuff because I didn't really know enough to have anything very useful to say. So I did, I did, I did a lot of stuff, about 20 years worth of stuff, in mm. fact. It started with founding, founding a web startup or nearly founding a web startup in my 20s, which kind of came to an end in 2008 with the great crash. Then I went off and retrained as a psychotherapist. I left London, got married, had a child, um, spent a stint as a stay-at-home mum and fell into writing kind of by mistake through that because when she got to about two, I just started... You, I mean, you spend the first couple of years with a child being very preoccupied and just mm. kind of in love with your child. And then when about, after about two years, you start to get some of your own sort of brain functions back. I thought At you were going to say, and you start mm. hating them. No, 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 no. I mean, the, the, the love never goes away, of course. Um, nor does the mum Bluetooth, really. Mm. Um, but the Bluetooth gets less intense when they get a bit older. Um, so I started to get some of my own brain functions back. And I, I, I mean, I don't, you know... Not to put too fine a point on that, I started to get a little bit bored. Um, so I started blogging my daughter's artwork in the style of a contemporary art gallery. Um, it was kind of a running joke, really, with a friend who is actually, she's, she's a writer on art and a, and a digital artist, and she, who, had a, who had a baby at the same time as me. Um, she's an old friend from university. And we, start, we started sending each other kind of you know, two toddler, toddler scrawls, but with very, very serious chin stroke and commentary in the style mm -hmm. of a, you know, a, an art gallery. And I started blogging them just because it was it was just something to do, and it kind of, and it accidentally went viral. And a friend of mine, you know, an old friend from my startup days, I ran into, said, "Oh, Mary, you should write more, because because I be, I really enjoyed it. It's really funny. I mean, she's a mum, and also she was a, she's a gallery owner, and she just found the whole thing hilarious. She said, oh, you should write more. So so I did. I started. I thought, well, I've got a bit of time. You know, my daughter's seeing going to a childminder for a few hours a week. I'm going to spend a bit of that time writing because I can." And I've always, I've always enjoyed it, so why, why not? So I pitched a couple of things to a couple of places. And then I'd literally written two or three things for no money and unheard, got in touch and said, would you like to pitch to us? And I said, okay. And as it happens, I had a pitch half written, which I hadn't dared to send to them. So I said, well, would you like, would you be interested in this? And they said, maybe. And I, so I wrote that for them. And I think I've written for them pretty much every week since. That was September 2019. And I mean, it's, it's, not really, it's not really a story which is ever supposed to happen, I think, mm. but that's, that's basically... Well, I'm glad it has happened, uh, Mary, because as I say, I think you're, you're writing and it, it, it's very clear to me that you're someone who's lived a life outside of the commentariat. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that comes very strongly through your work. I think a lot of people uh, sort of, you know, go to Oxford, go to Cambridge, do this degree, do that degree, and then by the time they're 25, they're writing for the whatever. And look, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think your your, your commentary is informed by that. So let me ask a question that we, we always try to ask, if we can, of people, as broadly as possible. What is happening in the world, in your opinion, at the moment, and why? Uh, well, I think we've... Several things. We've, we've gone out the other end of never-ending growth. We have left the era of never ending growth and most and a lot of what's happening at the macroeconomic level is people kicking the can down the road with their hands over their ears and saying la 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 as loudly as possible mm. so that's one thing i think which is happening 
we've also come out the other end of um, where we're already into the era of ecological exhaustion and slow motion ecological collapse. Um, we are well and truly into the Anthropocene. I mean, these are all sort of very macro things. Um, we've we've de we've left the era of liberal democracy and are now living in something else, and I'm not completely sure what to call it yet. And we've we've left the industrial age and are now in the digital age. And all of these things are interacting in ways which are complicated, you know, infinitely complicated. And I guess my writing is about trying to make sense of all of the different ways everything we believed and everything we thought was good in the previous age is now bad mm. in the new age. I mean, I mean that's, that's my sort of overarching mm. thesis for where we are. Everything, everything that was good is now bad. <laughs> and uh, working, working, through the, working through how that affects people. So just to finish on that, uh, well, not to finish on that. I don't think we're going to finish on that anytime <laughs> soon. But <laughs> no, just, no, no, we've literally just started on just that. Just before Francis jumps in, because I know he has a lot of questions for you as well. Everything was good is now bad. So what used to be good? Uh, family? tradition like give us give, give us a little flesh on, on the bones there well I, I mean i would i would actually turn that around and i would say you know everything all the liberating ourselves from family used to be good mm. it's now bad because we've we've got about as liberated from family as it's possible to get with that i mean I, on the the conservative think tank onward published a report just today um reporting on the epidemic of loneliness among young people you know many of whom report just literally having no friends I mean, at best, they just have a, a set of parasocial relationships, but they have no friends. I mean, I think I don't. I don't think I don't think people need to be any more liberated from emotional commitments than they already are. And yet, we still have this sort of legacy narrative about how we should just be free to be free to be who we want, man. And I don't think that I don't think that's interacting in a healthy way with actually where we are. That that would be just one example. There are lots. Mm -hmm. And you said there are lots of examples. When you were started to tell to talk to us about where we are, I just felt myself sinking into a deep depression. <laughs> Mary, I'm going to be a honest. It's a natural state for him to Which, be honest. You know, I'm a comedian. That is a natural state. Is it as depressing as it sounds? Well, I mean, when I say when I all of I, I give you all of these pretty kind of miserable headliners, but I mean, all of these are very long-term slow-motion things. So you know, ecological collapse collapse isn't something which is likely to happen tomorrow. It will happen in slow motion over the course of decades and probably you know and it might just look like radical climate change and a completely different geopolitical setup i mean it's not going to look like complete obliteration of the human species i don't think or like you know a sort of the matrix like rise of the machines scenario that all seems a bit far-fetched but you know we i mean weather patterns becoming unpredictable is something which has been remarked on a lot this year um it's not the first year that weather patterns have seemed strange um you know weather has has pre pretty enormous downstream effects again in slow motion you know migrations of whole peoples you know there are there are there are arguments that the, the little ice age had colossal geopolitical effects over the course of um well the the beginning of the enlightenment um, and the the whole sort of late medieval period um you know we 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 might just be in for that but you know th this is all you know this could be a narrative arc of 100 years you know most of which you you and I won't be alive for so you know there's there's plenty of room for beauty and endeavor and heroism and you know all of the kind of you know granular human stuff in all of that right and plus soon you'll be dead mate yeah, yeah and, and and we're all going to die anyway so so whatever you know there's plenty of plenty of room to have have birthday parties and kids and you know live heroic lives Good before, times, before thank you. <laughs> completely pear shaped, right? Yeah. And it might not go pear shaped. I mean, you, you know, we could be we could be on the cusp of something amazing as well. But I think there, are, it's it's definitely a mixed bag. But you say like we're moving from the industrial age to the digital age. To me, I very much see COVID as a catalyst yes. for that. Yes. Yes. Uh, would you delve into that a little bit more for us? How COVID has essentially speeded up everything? It has. It has. I mean, I think there was a lot of those trends were were pretty well established already. I mean, I think the, the the headliners there are virtualization and de and centralization, yeah, centralization and dematerialization. Well, the, the, there's a bit of a mouthful, but you know, the the ideas there being that, for example, where local newspapers were once the sort of you know mediators of news, you know, the functions that used to be taken by local newspapers have just got eaten up by Facebook, which is this centralized platform. That talks about disintermediating and you know just freeing everybody up to just kind of do their amateur thing, 
and to an extent that's true. I mean, you know, independent media is a marvelous thing. I'm here enjoying it and participating in it. But but there's also but the the smashing the the knocking away of all of those intermediate institutions, for example, in journalism, has created a space where you know suddenly a very few players have an enormous amount of power. As, as, as for example, we see when um, big tech can decide en masse to deplatform the president of the United States, mm. which happened not so long ago. So de dematerialization. So you know, all of those all of those local newspapers are physically no longer there. You know, a lot of them have just gone. Um, and centralization. Um, big tech now controls an enormous amount of uh, what's of the, of the available bandwidth for what is or is not sayable. And I mean that's that that that's one one instance, um, but but the trends are observable in all kinds of places. I mean you can even see it in the Church of England, which is kind of a, a bonkers example to give, you'd think. But you know there was a there's been a hoo ha this week about the Church of England releasing a, a report where they're saying, oh, well no actually actually we don't need churches or even priests. We can just have lay people can you know evangelizing and growing the Church of England. They can all just meet up in people's houses and it'll be great. And that will free up unnecessary resources from, to, I don't know, quite, quite what they're planning to, to maybe they just want to free up, free up more bishop time to produce PowerPoints or lobby the government on, <laughs> on foreign aid spending. Or, I don't know quite, quite what it is that they propose to replace uh, ministry with. But, I mean, but, but, but you, you see what I mean, it's the same pattern. There's a, sort of, there's a, a measure of centralisation among a smaller group of sort of managerial elite types coupled with... Um, cu coupled with th things dematerializing, you know, this idea that you know, in fact, we can do without church buildings, and it's the same. It's 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 a, it's roughly the same template as the dematerialization and centralization of news media. And what do you think? What do you affect? Do you think this is having on society? Well, I think well, one one impact it's having is that it's it's annihilating all the people in the middle. Um, in a sense, you know, it's it, it it's just it it's obliterating the middle class. It's and. You by obliterating, do you do you genuinely mean obliterating? As in, there will be no middle class, and that is the inevitable consequences of what we're seeing. I don't think it's I don't think it's inevitable, but it, it has already hollowed out an enormous stretch of the middle class. I mean, if you if you consider if you consider all of those jobs that used to be there, for example, in journalism or in manufacturing or in you know any of these sort of physically based um, occupations and industries. Um, which are now, which are now theory, which have been either been physically outsourced to other countries, or they've been, or they've been virtualized and rendered more efficient. I mean, we, I suppose we could take the law, for example, you know, which is a classical middle class profession. Um, you know, with with clerical jobs increasingly going to AIs, um, you know, such as you know, once upon a time there was a guy whose job it was just to go and find things in the archive. You know, if, well, the moment you can replace that with a search engine, you know, the law firms can save themselves a lot of money, right? Um, and and the consequence of that is that uh, you know an, 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 an awful lot of people who once had reasonably well paid clerical jobs now don't anymore. Um, so I, I don't know. If we, I mean, completely obliterating is probably put, is putting it rather strongly. You know, there's still plenty of middle class people left. Um, but you know, if you look at that, I mean, I, well, one, one of the things I wrote about not long ago was what I what, what I call Ayala's law. Um, which is to say, the internet power law is now being rolled out in real life, and this is the the internet. The, you know, the power law of how things work on the internet um, has been has been observable since the early days of social media. Um, the the one nine ninety law, which is to say, um, it, on in any given social internet space, uh, one percent of the users will generate most of the content. The next nine percent will generate quite a lot, and ninety percent will mostly just hang out a bit. Um, but that also, that also goes for earnings on the internet. So if you look at if you look at any given internet platform, say eBay or Amazon or YouTube, indeed, um, one percent of the one percent of the contributors will reap most of the gains. Um, Nine percent will re will do pretty well, and ninety percent will just get the long tail. Um, Ayala has Ayala posted a graph. Um, Ayala, for anybody who doesn't who isn't aware, is an extremely high earning performer on the pornography website OnlyFans. Um, she's she's in the top 0.6%, I believe, of earners, and in a good month can make several hundred thousand dollars. Um, so so she's she's right up at the top of the curve. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the majority of performers on OnlyFans, or indeed the majority of sellers on eBay, will will make you know a few quid here and there. Um, and that that law I see in the digital age, I think, is being rolled out in real life as well. Mm. So and, 
And I mean, one of the things you talk about COVID and lockdown, one of the things that's definitely been happening is the further accumulation of wealth right yep. at the top. Yep. Uh, yep. And the immiseration of everybody else, yes. pretty much. Yes. COVID has rolled out Ayala's law um, comprehensively throughout all kinds of areas of society, which were still resisting it because it effectively banned real life alternatives to the the kind of virtualization and centralization that I'm talking about. Mm. And what about, uh, Francis, did, did you have another question about this? Yes. So the, the question that I want to ask, and again, it's, it's touching on the real world impacts. What effect does that have on the real world? Now, we've talked about the middle class, but doesn't that just exacerbate the atomization, the feeling of loneliness? Because we're destroying our communities, aren't we? Yep. Great. Happy? Yeah. You got the answer you were looking well, yes, for. Absolutely. Everything is fucked. Congratulations, yeah. mate. Yeah. You can relax now. Let me ask something <laughs> else. Uh, uh, Mary, we joke, of course, but seriously, in terms of the, the culture, coming back perhaps to where we started, you were talking about how everything that used to be good is now bad. Can we get more into that? Because uh, I guess th this is one of the things we've been wrestling with on the show that there seems to be a radical cultural transformation. And, and you know, if you talk to Jordan Peterson, he'll say that it's, it's primarily driven by technology. Other people have different points of view about it. But there's a sort of feeling like the, the pace of cultural change is accelerating and the world is very rapidly becoming unrecognizable. So I'll give you an example. I, I was just in Ukraine a few weeks ago visiting my grandmother, who's 95. And she said to me, A, what do you do for a living? And B, what's your book about? And I found myself unable to speak because how do you explain <laughs> these things to a 95-year-old in Ukraine who lived through Stalinism and the German Nazi occupation? Like, she does not, she's very clued up for a 95-year-old, but she has absolutely no reference for all this nonsense that the three of us are involved with. So what is happening in the culture and why, do you feel? I think that's that's a difficult thing to answer comprehensively because mm. it it completely depends where you're standing. I mm. mean, as your as your grandmother mm. illustrates. I mean, what's what's happening what's happening in where we are in East London is very different to what's happening where I where I am in Bedfordshire mm. and where I live in Bedfordshire. I mean, they're they're related, obviously, um, but they're but they're not quite the same thing at all. So I mean, where I where I live in Bed Bedfordshire has been up till now at least relatively immune to a lot of this radical stuff. You can still say pretty much what you like to people. Um, it, there are there are still strong local community bonds. You know, it's it can it contrasts quite quite sharply with what life is like, say, in a in a very high turnover part of the 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 country's capital. Um, you know, most most people where I live have have jobs locally. Um, that that doesn't really, you know, it's it's not it's not so much a Zoom classes place, but it but it's also, <laughs> but it's also right at the sharp end of um, a lot of you know, the sort of economic transformation of the country. You know, where I live right on the Oxford or the Oxford Cambridge Arc, which is where they're planning to build the ten million or whatever it is houses that the country is currently missing. So all of the all of the green spaces that I currently run through and enjoy just as footpaths and countryside will probably be gone in the next ten years, and turned into you know never-ending urban sprawl. You know, I have very mixed feelings about that because on the one hand people have got to live somewhere, and on the other hand I I, I like the countryside where I live mm. and enjoy it and would prefer to live in the countryside. So, um, what is what is happening in the culture overall in in terms of you know what everything that we thought was good is bad and everything. It, it it just I, I, it, it's not something I find easy to answer because it's it's so contextual. It really is. I mean, but look, I would argue that of course, for the moment, you you can feel somewhat isolated from what's happening in East London in Bedfordshire. You can for the moment, right? But it, you you are isolated from it in the same way that a manufacturing worker in the nineties was isolated from from people who believed in globalization yes. in London, right? You're isolated from it until it takes a job. Yes. Right. Uh, and and you're isolated from the culture war and whatever else until until the the public education system starts teaching your three year old yes. whatever it is, gender ideology or wh whatever else you Just want. So. so the that I, I feel that anyone who thinks that way, and I'm not saying that you do, but anyone who has that illusion 
is going to get disabused of it very, very quickly. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I occupy a funny sort of position living where I do in that most most of my working life is spent in 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 the discourse you know with a capital T and a capital D mm, you know mm. I mean the discourse is kind of what I do for a living and yeah. I've been I've been very online for 20 years so I enjoy living in the countryside and I run a lot because that's the only way I can stay sane and stop myself from just drifting away altogether into the discourse um so on the one hand I enjoy being grounded in a local community where you know there are I, I have local mum friends, etc. On the other, on the on the other, I have this sort of parallel existence, which is in this strange kind of disembodied world where people worry about this stuff, and you know, and it and it really does give me double vision sometimes. So I wander, you know, I wander around my local area, and sometimes it just feels insubstantial, as though it could just sort of blow away, like like a sandcastle drying out, and just become I don't know what will be left behind. You say, and you, it's a very powerful image that you've just used. Do, do you think that? That's what's going to happen in inevitably, or do you think there will be a pushback against what we're seeing? I mean, I probably neither. Um, I mean, England's market towns have been around for a long time. You know, where I live has has existed for the last thousand years. You know, I don't think that's I don't think it's likely to disappear overnight. Um, but but although I don't really believe in progress in any sort of absolute sense, I don't think it's a thing. Um, I do, you know, cultures do evolve and, you know, places, places and communities change their meaning and their inflection over time. And there's sort of, there's nothing you can really do about that. So I'm kind of, I'm sort of fairly resigned doomer mm. in that sense. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't see my, I don't, I don't see Bedfordshire and its communities just kind of blowing away like a sandcastle in the wind. But I do, I do think, I do think, as you say, things are changing very rapidly. Um, and a lot of the things that we we thought were just dead certs forever are, are, are really not. Mm. Now, when you say you, you don't believe in progress, what, what do you mean by that? Because, I mean, objectively speaking, if we compare ourselves to humanity 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, so I think you'd be very, you'd be very easy to argue humanity has made a lot of progress. Well, I mean, it's, I, I would actually disagree. I mean, because I think at the moment, if you say, well, you know, we've we've progressed over the last thousand years, you've got to define what you mean by progress. Longer, li longer life expectancy. Right, but at that point, you've already begged the question. I've already. You, you've I mean, begging the question, as in you've, you know, in in the in the way you phrased the question, yeah. you've already you've already predetermined your answer. Uh, okay, so but would you would you so, argue that it's unfair to say that people living longer, healthier lives? Uh, I mean, I see what you're saying in my, a way. My, my, my point yeah, is that there are always trade-offs. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. So, for example, you might argue that the fact that we live longer is a is a product of a society that also means we live in atomized uh, groups, and therefore we're not connected with family. We have fewer children, and and blah blah blah, and we end up dying in care homes as opposed to being looked after by immediate family. Just so. Yeah. Just so. You know what? What I'm saying is not that you know so, that nothing ever gets better or that we're getting worse. My point is simply, you know, the reason I don't believe in progress in some sort of an absolute sense is that I think all the all the things that we measure as progress are just measured as such by bracketing all of the ways that they constitute trade-offs. So you know, the moment you frame such and such as as pro as as your your me your metric for progress, you've already you've already um, answered your own question. Okay. What about penicillin? <laughs> Well, I mean, but, but penicillin is great, um, but it, but yeah, you know, what what about superbugs? Touche. <laughs> Touche. I mean, you know, my 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 point is simply that you know, it's it's not obvious to me that humanity, you know, taken in its total, is you know in a is is in some way morally improved from over a thousand or two thousand years ago. Let me it's, keep in, trying. In, <laughs> what what about a, a lack of Stalinism and uh, and purges and gulags and well, sure, but we we didn't have Stalinism before Stalinism either. Yeah, I mean, we kind of did, though, didn't we? Like, you know, we had the Inquisitions and the. What about what about Xinjiang then? Yeah, you know, we we, we don't not have Stalinism anymore. It's true. You know, that we, is true. I I don't believe in progress. I don't... All right, well, I'm going to get depressed as well. <laughs> Fucking hell! It's, it's great to have you on, Mary. I, we thought you know we'd get someone interested in, but no, yeah, you yeah, know, sure. talk, just you know, sh sh you know. This is the ultimate black pill episode. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, thing, the thing is, like, it's not. It's not that I. I'm. 
You're not, not depressed that, about it. No, you I'm just, not. Yeah. I'm really not depressed about any of this. Yeah, because it's so I'm, bad. Why bother? Yeah. Do you no, take I a mean, certain I've, nihilistic glee in it? Absolutely not. No, <laughs> I, I think there's there's immense scope in human life for beautiful, heroic, wonderful, transcendental experiences. I just don't think things are necessarily never-endingly getting better. Yeah. Mm. You know, humanity evolves and cu cultures and ideas and people and places and every everything evolves. And just just tracing that is itself astonishingly beautiful. Um, it's just it's just not constantly getting better. It's just changing. I think mm. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, if you look at the last decade to suggest that things are getting better would. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd, I'd buy that argument. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends where you're standing. You know, I mean, if you're if you're an upper middle class white person who who inherited wealth sometime in the late 1990s and got on the London housing ladder before the before the colossal boom, then you, you'd be forgiven for thinking that things things have been continuously getting better. But you know, for somebody not very far down the road from that person, it really might not feel like that at all. Or for you know, not that many years younger than that person, it might not feel like that at all. You know, if you're no, it's a, it's it's an excellent point. I mean, uh, let, let's touch on a subject that has never upset or offended anybody or gets anybody angry. Feminism. You write a lot. Uh -oh. <laughs> you write a lot about go. feminism. I Here particularly enjoy your articles. Would you describe yourself as a feminist, Mary? <laughs> and if you do, what does that mean to you? Well, my Twitter bio says reactionary feminist. Okay. Which... What does that mean? Let's start <laughs> well, with that. Well, it's it. It started as some banter. It was literally just a running joke between me and one of my friends. Mm. Um, I had a long-standing argument with a friend about the term post-liberal, um, which people attach to me. I don't attach it to myself, but people attach the term post-liberal to me. And, and I had a long-standing argument about with a friend who, who's of the opinion that I was not a post-liberal, I was a reactionary. And I said, no, I am not a reactionary. I, reactionaries are bad people. And he, 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 he's finally sort of, you know, his, his take was essentially that post-liberals are just reactionaries who don't inhale. Um, and you know, it, it was a it was a very long running, very sort of it was a a, a long standing banter back and forth about about post liberals and reactionaries. And in the course of which, I changed my Twitter bio just to see how long it would take him to notice. Mm -hmm. But I sort of I came to think that actually it's it, it it's a fun placeholder. I like reactionary because people are going to call me that anyway. Mm -hmm. They're bound to because I I acknowledge, for example, that humans can't change sex. Um, which is already already a, a serious enough heresy to have you have you dumped among the bad people, mm. and also because I don't believe in progress. Um, and one of the questions that has preoccupied me for a long time is how is is it even possible to to take to to argue for women's interests if you don't believe in progress? Because feminism, as we understand it, is pretty inseparable from the whole sort of liberal progress narrative. This idea that you know we are where we're going from a bad place where everything everything was terrible and benighted mm. to a good place where everybody is enlightened and it's all good and we have rights and so on. Mm. Um, and why is that not true? I mean, you can vote now. You you know your husband can't beat you with a stick. Yes, which is all great. You know, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I'm I'm very much in favour of. So all what, of are the, <laughs> what are the trade offs that you are concerned about? In, well, in, <laughs> in, in that situation, I mean, yeah, there are. What is worth being beaten with a stick for? <laughs> I guess is what I'm getting at. <laughs> I mean, that's a bold oh question, mate. I'm going to be honest well, with you. Well, that, that, I'm just following the logical line here. Um, and giving Mary you, the opportunity to elucidate. Yeah, give, give, me, so give, give me a nice long length of rope that I can mm, hang myself yeah. with. Um, let, me be, let me be perfectly clear. I am fully, fully, fully in favour of, um, very grateful to my foremothers for securing for me, um, the right to exist as a person, you know, in contemporary post-industrial, contemporary sort of liberal era uh, terms. There's a very, very, very long answer to your question, which we probably don't have time for today, to do with the, I mean, it's, it's essentially my thesis that what we understand as feminism is one iteration in the context of industrial modernity of a much of just an eternal debate, which is to say how men and women can reconcile their not always perfectly aligned interests which are fundamentally rooted in our different reproductive roles. You know, what men, what men want and need out of, out of the opposite sex and out of society is not, doesn't completely overlap with what women need. And, you know, a lot of, you know, and it's an eternal source of kind of cultural negotiation, let's yes. say, um, how, how we go about squaring these two sets of interests. And in different material contexts and different, you know, sociocultural contexts, that plays out very differently. 
And it is my view that in the context of uh, industrial modernity, um, well, when, when, when society is industrialized, that left women quite disadvantaged in some, in some ways which are specific to, to the material conditions of industrial modernity, particularly to do with how work was reorganized. You know, there's suddenly this very stark split between work and home, which left women um, pretty very on the back foot. And, you know, so to an extent still subject to, to an older set of patriarchal social codes, but with, without any of the social and cultural power that they had previously wielded, you know, in a, in a medieval setup. In other words, you're expected to go to work and you don't have the sort of uh, the protections that are afforded to women in a more patriarchal traditional society. Let's well, say. Um, you're, you're, you're getting ahead of, I'm, I'm thinking really of the 19th century mm. here, where all of a sudden women were, where women were expected to be the angel by the hearth. Yeah. Um, and, but they, and, and completely economically inact inactive. Yes. Uh, but they, they had no, they had no personhood independent from their husbands as a legacy of, a, of an older patriarchal way of doing things in the medieval era, which was semi, I mean, you know, not without problems and not without abuses. And you, I mean, there are plenty of, you can cite plenty of abuses of women from the, from the Middle Ages. I mean, obviously, you know, witch burnings to, to name but one. However, you know, there were, it was a, it was a setup that was more or less functional in a context where, where both, both, both adults in a household worked, you know, within a household. I mean, if you think about, you know, sort of typical kind of artisan or, you know, reasonably well-off kind of yeoman household in the Middle Ages, you know, women worked as well as men because everybody was engaged in, in some sort of subsistence activity. Um, but that changed in the industrial era because all of a sudden work happened, you know, out there in a factory or whatever. And I mean, I'm talking here about the middle classes again. You know, this is, it's very difficult to pin this stuff down because it's so contextual. But for the for the bourgeoisie, suddenly women were supposed to be this kind of this very sort of very constrained kind of um, st still no still no independent person had still no right to own property. Um, and suddenly you don't really have any role outside just raising children. And so so that that prompted, you know, women who are obviously people just like men um, to say, well, hang on a minute. This is a bit boring mm. and nobody really this. This is just a bit shit. So <laughs> we, we, we would like we would like to be deemed persons. You know, under the new, well, you know, we we exist in a, we we live in a democracy just like you. Can we vote, please? Can we own property? Can we work? And you know, the 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 but but it was it was the it was the economic shift that drove the um that drove the political shift. And then again, you know, with the the advancement of technology, you know, all of a sudden, you know, all of the sort of housewife drudgery started to fade away because you just you don't have to do your washing by hand anymore. And so all of a sudden that frees up a whole lot of time. And suddenly women are looking out and thinking, you know, they, they seem to be having a more interesting time of it. You know, why can't we go and, um, you know, I, I, we'd quite like to work as well. You know, we're just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. I mean, and this is, I mean, this, this is immensely complicated territory and I'm really not doing it justice here. No, I, 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 I actually I, I hear forget, a lot yeah. of what you're saying. I mean, it, it's even more dangerous for me to articulate some of these right. things than it is right, for right. you. <laughs> but I suppose uh, if you look at women's mental well-being over the last... Uh, I don't know, a few decades, let's say, or more than that, maybe last six, seven, eight decades, you don't necessarily see much progress. In fact, you see a decline, seemingly at least, right? Um, so I, I see your your point about trade-offs. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, what, we've, what we've ended up in is a situation, I mean, the, the, there's this sort of uh, eternal tension, you know, between um, one, between desiring equality between the sexes and accept and and acknowledging the difference, the physiological differences between the sexes. And I think that you know, I mean, that tension is not one that you can abolish, even though you know recent activists are definitely trying. But you know, it's irreducible. It's how we make new humans, right? Um, you know, unless we're going to stop doing that, um, you know, there are certain irreducible facts about how you make new humans, which are very difficult to get away from completely. And and that's you know the fact that you know only one sex gestates and only one sex can breastfeed. Um, We're getting you know, into very controversial territory. Indeed, here. indeed we are, and I'm skirting around some really quite radioactive territory. You here, don't but, need you know, to none, skirt around it. Yeah. No, no, indeed. But I'm you know I'm, I'm very careful about what I say mm. and on this Damn. subject. And very, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get cancelled probably sooner or later. But you know, perhaps perhaps what, it won't be today. Uh, Mary, who cares? What, I'm gonna. What? Why? What? Why are we so worried? 
about skirting around this territory. When I think, you know, as human, you know, as human beings, as intelligent adults, we all know what the truths are. Why are right, we skirting um, around these territories? Well, there's a. I'm not afraid of being cancelled for saying that humans can't change sex. I have no concern about that. I mean, I'm I'm out and out and proud and have been for some time about my my views on that. So you know, that's I'm I'm not concerned about being cancelled for that because were that to take place, it would already have happened. However, um, I I tread cautiously when it comes to how people feel about their identities because I came to the subject of trans politics via um, personal involvement in the trans scene as it was, you know, very nascently in the noughties. You know, I, was, I, I, I know a lot of people who were, who began, I mean, all the, all the, all the women I dated in the noughties have, have since become men. This is something I... I so it's your fault. <laughs> well, I, did, well, I did wonder for a bit. I did wonder for a bit, but I no, actually, I mean, you you, you joke, but it, I did think, is it me? Um, but no, 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 I really don't think it is. I think it's it's just straightforwardly that I, I was, you know, in as much as I'm attracted to women, I was always attracted to butch women, and and not unreasonably, um, a lot of butch women have opted for life as a transgender man because why wouldn't you? Considering trans men get get stunning and brave, and butch women get. Um, not not very kind or understanding treatment. I mean, why why would you not? Um, you know, especially if you've been always felt uncomfortable with you know the expectations placed on women and prefer to adopt more masculine style and presentation and dress and so on. I completely understand why why a lot of a lot of female body why why a lot of pe female body people would would opt for opt for that pathway and just sort of go go all the way there and and, and find and find it genuinely more comfortable. And so, you know, I, I I say this just to just to explain why, you know, I, I I'm very I I'm careful in what I say on the subject, not because I want to skirt around the fact that humans humans can't literally change sex, but because I think it's really important not to dehumanise the individuals mm. involved, um, who often genuinely struggle and you know really suffer and you know really struggle with, you know, just a, a sort of existential state of discomfort, you know, in, in, in the dissonance between their physiology and identity. And I think it's really, really important not to be dehumanising in how we, how we talk about this, because it's very painful for a lot of people. I quite agree with you. And actually, I found the, the, that comment that you made really remarkable, that there's a lot of butch women, particularly butch lesbians, who would prefer to transition and live their life permanently medicalised as a, as a, inverted commas, as a man, than they would do as a woman living a perfectly normal, natural life. That to me seems awful. Yeah. Is it, is it really that bad for them? Yeah, I, I think being, being gender non-conforming is extremely difficult. Mm. You know, and if, if anything, it's more difficult now than it was um, 20 years ago. I mean, I think about, I mean, my, my husband's a little bit older than me. He's sort of proper Gen X, whereas mm. I'm kind of borderline, borderline Gen X millennial. And, you know, his, his musical and sort of aesthetic era is the new romantics. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think about some of the, some, some of the, some of the sort of celebrity figures from, from that era, the late 80s and up to the early 1990s, they were all gender bending merrily, left, right mm. and center. And you think about Marilyn and, well, I mean, you name, you name it, any of the Boy new George. romantics. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the whole the, the whole of pop culture there was filled with people who were just really playing very creatively with the boundaries of gender presentation, and that all just seems to have gone. I mean, I was but you, if you watch Top of the Pops from from that era, and uh, you know from from the seventies through to through to I suppose perhaps the late nineteen eighties. I mean, you think I, 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 you watch that and you see the women perform, and you think, my God, they're wearing a lot of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's really striking. And it's not just, but it's not just a decency thing, you know. Patty Smith would get up on stage wearing a pair of sort of brown corduroy flares, and nobody tried to put her in a little fucking Britney Spears sort of warrior battle bikini, like they like they do. <laughs> battle with, bikini. You, you, I mean, you know exactly the sort of outfit I'm talking about. Yeah. Rhinestone spangled battle bikinis seems to be kind of the order of the day if you want to be a, a female performer. And the only way you can be at all, you know, anything kind of curvier than anorexic is if you're if you started life as a stripper. Um, you know, those are those are the options available. You know, the the sec the pornification of women in in the culture now 
and the you know the sort of extremeness and the, the I mean you think about the contestants on Love Island you know they all, all the girls are kind of you know with their boobs hitched up to here and their botox and their fillers and the highlights and what have you and all the guys are, are it's a sort of pumped up pumped up kind of uh, Ken dolls covered in with their arms covered in biro you know it's this sort of incredibly kind of cartoonish you know hyper masculine and hyper feminine stereotypical um, aesthetic which which yeah it it doesn't leave doesn't leave very much scope for gender creative expression so i can i can really understand how people who just don't comfortably fit those sorts of extreme stereotypes could could find themselves thinking well actually maybe i should just join the other team and just literally become the other team because that's just going to be less less of a miserable paradox to try and occupy i get that and i can see why people would think no actually the uh the trade-offs in terms of you know osteoporosis and you know 25 years off my life or whatever it whatever it is you know it's that seems that seems like a reasonable trade i can see how people get there that that is so sad when you consider what the narrative that is being fed to us that you know we're more free liberal than ever before we're more accepting than ever before but actually you know the narrative that the media is showing us the images and also let's be fair social media as well it's it's a very much the opposite of that isn't it yeah i mean one of the i i, I did a i i wrote something about um have, have I, I i wanted to i wanted to explore you know the what what's understood about you know how much you know what what, what basis is there for thinking about you know there are actually you know, psychological normative differences between the sexes um, I, wrote, I I looked into it and I found a really interesting study um, which showed that um, the people are more likely to think of themselves as very masculine or very feminine in societies where where the material where materially people are more egalitarian. So people cling more strongly to masculine and feminine sex roles. The the more egalitarian life is in in reality, you know, women are less likely to to go off and study science and engineering and maths in where, where, where the culture is where, where, where women are women are more likely to do um egal to study egalitarian subjects or to take an interest in science where the culture itself is more sexist and more sex role differentiated which seems really odd until you think about it and you think well you know people people intuitively sense that there is you know there is something different mm -hmm. between men and women we're not quite sure what it is but you know, if if everyone's saying, oh, you know, men and women can both do everything, and you know, men men can be stay-at-home parents, and women can be, you know, you know, ball-busting CEOs, and yada yada yada, and there are in fact no material differences between us at all, then but but people still feel instinctively that there is something, there is something different, and so instead they kind of construct this sort of exaggerated masculinity or femininity as a way of making up for the sort of the sense that we're all just kind of disintegrating into a sort of grey goo. I mean, I mean, that's that's my that's my reading of what's going on there. Whether it's whether it's true or not, I don't know. But, but, but my sense is that people people want there to be a difference of some kind between men and women. People people kind of people feel it matters. And, you do know, you think it's that they want, or do you think that they're tired of being told there isn't, even though all their objective life experience is telling them that there is, and, have, and they're I've, just tired of living a lie, like with so many other issues? It could just be. It could be that. It could be that. I mean, I I, I don't know. Um, I mean, so it's certainly what what has what has felt very true to me is that it's very you can pretend that there are no differences between men and women until you have children, mm -hmm. and the fact that more people are putting off children until ever, later and later, or just not having children at all, um, is is increasing the constituency of people who pretend that there are no differences between the sexes. Um, but but the rubber really hits the road when you have children. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, it's it's um, it, it it's only me. It's most, it was only me who was able to nurse a baby. You know, it was me. It was me who, who who grew her in my literal entrails. And and actually, you know, physiologically, that came with a whole load of changes. I'm reading this amazing book at the moment that's just about it's it's coming out shortly called Mum Genes, which is all about the physiological changes that come with go changing from being a woman to being a mother. Because it literally it literally rewires your brain. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of hopefully mostly sort of functional. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, co co cognitively, I think I do okay, um, but but it completely rewires your brain, you know. And and, and actually, you know, even 
every child that you carry as a woman, as a mother, um, leaves traces of their DNA inside your body permanently. Uh, this is absolutely wild. I, I didn't know this. Um, you know, my sense that this sense I had of being kind of symbiotically connected to my baby actually has a material basis in the sense that, you know, every child you carry you know, leaves traces of DNA that just sloshes around inside you and will will actually will actually repair injuries that you have. So if you if you cut yourself, you know, the the I think that they call it microchimerism, which is to say, you know, sort of genetic you you you, you become sort of chimerically interconnected with your child literally at a cellular level and you know the and the, the the cell the trace cells the trace dna which is left behind by your child will will repair injuries to your body you know my i have a c-section scar that was probably repaired by my daughter's dna even though she was she was physically gone from my body by then it's, it's just nuts when you think about it and within the sort of atomized paradigm we have of you know of what humans are and how humans uh relate to one another, it makes no sense. It just doesn't compute this idea that we're interconnected and can be interconnected, you know, even at a cellular level. And that's particularly true for women in a way which is just, it can't be true for men. You know, that, that's, that's sort of in, in violation of a number of pretty kind of fundamental beliefs that we have about, well, for, for one thing, about the, the sameness between men and women and, and also about the, the fact that we're all separate and atomized and sort of propelling ourselves around like 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 billiard balls around a table, and in fact the reality is is much messier and stickier and more sort of interconnected than that, and that's that's more pronounced for women than it is for men. It's it's a really great point and it's fascinating. And one of the things that you touched on that I particularly wanted to talk to you about because it was something that concerned me when I was a teacher is what you talked about, which was the pornification of women. What impact do you think porn, uh, pornography is having on our society? and particularly on its impact on women? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not really at the coalface of this because I've mm. been married for nearly 10 years. Mm. Um, I'm, so I'm not, I'm not really at the sharp end of dating and relationships so much. Um, but from younger friends um, of both sexes, actually, my, my sense is that it's, it's having a very radical impact. Um, women, I think there, there have been numerous studies done of this that indicate that women in particular are experiencing much higher levels of sexual violence, violence during sex. I think there was a study done last year that showed that over that something like three quarters of men have slapped or choked or spat on um, a, a woman, their, their partner during sex, men under 40, three quarters of them. Now, it may well be that some of those women were really into it, but all of them? I doubt it. I very much doubt it. Um, and this is coming directly from pornography. And and the difficulty there is that por I think of pornography. You know, it's not a it's not a it it's it's a it, it it has direction as well as force, right? Um, but by by which I mean, you know, you what you watch something that you you watch two people just having a shag, right? And that's that's really exciting, and maybe you and but then you watch it a couple of times, and it's just not so exciting anymore. Mm -hmm. So you go looking for something a bit more intense, and that and that that takes you uh, that takes any regular prolific consumer of pornography inexorably towards the really dark, the really violent, the really exploitative, and then all the way out there beyond the pale into, I don't know, children and animals and what have you. You know, pornography has, has, it has force and it also has direction. And, and it also replaces intimacy. Um, and I think this is, this is a problem that a lot of, as, as I understand it, a lot of young men are struggling with, some of them increasingly consciously. I think there are, there are hundreds of thousands of members now of the NOFAP boards, you know, where, you know, usually, usually adolescent, but, you know, men from all walks of life are really struggling with pornography addiction, you know, compulsive masturbation. Um, and I think, you know, people laugh and, and go, ah, losers, you know, you can't keep it in your pants. But I, I, I don't think, I don't think it's, I really don't think it's something to laugh at. I think what they're doing is genuinely heroic because the, the porn industry, the online porn industry is, a, is the most, the most kind of nakedly um, nakedly venal and just completely un out there in the open um, version of the the whole of the the internet dopamine machine, you know, full stop. You know, the, this whole you know that that want, wants to commodify people's desires um, and turn turn them into profit centers. I mean, most most of the internet is about that, right? You know, whether it's you know whether it's wanting to you know 
hack the hack the desire for you know social applause by encouraging us to get really addicted to social media platforms and the likes and the retweets and what have you and i fully confess i have a i have a fairly fairly serious and chronic twitter addiction so you know i'm speaking from experience there we've got but, no idea what you're talking about <laughs> absolutely absolutely not of course i mean you know i mean we're all we're all um We'll we'll all perhaps be in recovery together one day, <laughs> um, right? The, I mean, this is this is the water we all swim in, right? But mm. the but the pornography industry takes that absolutely to its its most squalid and venal conclusion, mm. you know, because it's every 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 hit you get there, um, it, it it's not just a little dopamine hit like you get from a from a tri- from a like or a retweet, um, it's an orgasm. So you know the the rewiring is more is 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 more direct and it's more it's more uh, comprehensive. And I think for a lot of people, it's it's very, very, very addictive, and and the whole the whole pornography industry is just set up directly to hack, um, to to hack people's people's you know absolutely basic sort of lizard brain um, mechanisms for reproduction, um, and the fact that there are the, there's this growing subculture of young men out there who are saying no, actually, I'm going to I'm going to disentangle the the vampire squid from my brain i think that's genuinely heroic and there's something really really quite quite sort of you know radical and yeah it's genuinely heroic and i you, you i don't i don't spend a huge amount of time on the nofap boards but i've 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 mm-hmm. i've scooted through them once or twice um you know not not sort of voyeuristically but just out of curiosity to see what the discourse there is like and it's you know a lot of people are really suffering you know, and they talk about falling off the wagon, and they support each other trying to get back on it. And yeah, I mean, there are there are corners of that discourse which are a bit weird. You know, the whole kind of semen retention thing is kind of a bit mad. But and there are there are bits of it get quite misogynistic, perhaps as well. Um, but but these are people who are trying to unplug themselves from the dopamine machine, and that's that's almost impossible to do. You know, as as witnessed by my own Twitter addiction. When I think about trying to quit Twitter, I just think, how am I going to do that? You know, it's as, it's it's every bit as addictive as the smoking, as which I which I finally quit ten years ago. Um, and in, in some ways, I think it's a direct replacement for it. Yeah. But you know, the, these this, this this is the this is where this is where we are as a culture. Is it's interesting. To the we're machine. rapidly running out of time because I think we're we're trying to scratch the surface of so much that we could talk about. But before we get to the end, uh, we we brought up feminism, never really got into it. Mm-hmm. But this is. An interesting, perhaps, point on which to wrap that conversation up for now until we we get you back and talk for seven hours instead of one, (laughs) Uh, which is what do you make then of strands of feminism who seem to be totally okay with this, totally okay with sex work, totally okay with pornography, uh, totally okay with the erosion of women's spaces in some cases. How, How does that work? I don't think it does. Well, I don't either, but I'm I'm guessing what I'm trying to say is how has that happened? How has it happened? Well, um, this is. I, I suppose central central to my reactionary feminist thesis is that we've come to the end of the gains that we can be can be made for women by centering freedom, and you know those strands of feminism which are now you know all about applauding prostitution and um, transgenderism and yada 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 you know the, the whole sort of meat Lego matrix this idea that we can just sort of monetize and commodify our bodies and that constitutes empowerment i think uh, that that's a that's a set of people who are still committed to the idea that it's possible to square feminism with uh, liberation in the digital age and i i just disagree with that i think i think they're looking at it wrong and when we need we we need to we need a root and branch re-examination of the material conditions we're in now not rather than just fighting yesterday's battles I mean, if you if you look at the digital age, you know, within if you're stuck in the if you're stuck in the industrial paradigm and you still think more liberation is self evidently better, then I can see how you could end up in that you know arguing for sex work or arguing for um, you know uploading our consciousnesses to the cloud or you know abolishing um, liberating women even from the from the constraints of biological sex for I don't know extra uterine gestation or just being men or whatever. Um, I, yeah, you know, I, I can see how if you if you're still chasing the high of liberation, you could still imagine those things might be feminist. But I'm, I'm not chasing the high of liberation. I think we're all of us, men and women alike, liberated enough. And what we need is more and better obligations. Like what? Well, I, I think we need that. That depends on who you are and who you're committed to and who your obligations are to. I mean, in my case, it's straightforwardly my obligations to my family, particularly to my daughter. 
but also to my extended family and to, to the people who I'm actually connected to and whom I love in real life. And, you know, beyond that to, to my working to my working relationships and my friends. I mean, the, I mean grounded commitments in actual relationships. Um, you know, parasocial relationships are great and fun and interesting and exciting, but, they, but, but they're insubstantial when it comes down to it. You know, internet friends come and go. Some of them turn into real life friends. You know, I've been online long enough to have, to have in real life friends who started out just as, you know, a DM chat. Um, but that's but 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 it's I think it's important to develop an ability to discern the difference and to be to be able to think very pragmatically about what actually matters. Um, so, you know, there, there isn't a universal answer to what more and more and better obligations means, but it, it's it's grounded in real relationships and not in not in ideology. Mary, I absolutely love this interview. It's uh, it's it's been challenging. It's we've discussed a variety of depressing. Topics. Uh, slightly, <laughs> but which it, for him is a dopamine. Yeah, yeah, to be yeah that yeah that is my pornography. So thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before we do our questions for our local supporters, uh, we always have one final question, which is, what is the one thing we're not talking about, but we really should be? In my opinion, it's the 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 very obvious conflict between liberal feminism and uh, climate change, ecological collapse. Um, in, I, I agree with Phyllis Schlafly, and I'll, I, this may well be the point where I get cancelled um, for quoting Phyllis Schlafly, who's a, an American conservative of the, who, who died about three months before Donald Trump was elected. Um, but it was, it was her opinion that women's liberation was not a result of moral progress, but of modern technology. And although there are plenty that I disagree with Phyllis Schlafly on, I do agree with her about that. I think a great deal of what we think of as um, liberation through progress is, is in fact liberation from drudgery through um, machines that just do the jobs for us. And I, 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 hope it's, I hope it doesn't happen in our lifetimes, but I can envisage a future in which most of those technological gifts are no longer with us or no longer widely available. Um, whether, whether we're talking about washing machines or whether we're talking about um, contraception, um, I think without, the, there is a, a, huge amount of, a huge amount of the ways in which women are liberated now are effects of, uh, of advanced of an advanced technological civilization, and should that civilization collapse, which we should all, which we must all hope it doesn't, um, we we may we might find ourselves in a situation where actually the, the the underlying underlying conditions that enabled feminism are just gone, and I think the environmental movement in particular is yet to get its head around that, with possible exception of Roger Hallam at, at Extinction Rebellion, who's who's considerably more switched on about this stuff than uh, most of his supporters. Really. Former guest on the show, Roger. Good, mm. good, good. Um, yeah, he's he's he he gets he gets a lot more I think than he lets on. Um, but I mean, just just to take one one specific example, um, hormonal contraception is ecologically catastrophic, and this is just something. This is an elephant in the room, as far as you know. I mean, most environmentalists would also consider themselves to be feminists. Um, so all of them all of them are keen that you know women should have reproductive autonomy, as am I. I should say. But um, where, where, when that comes to the mass rollout of the contraceptive pill worldwide, um, we, sh we should probably bear in mind the fact that it's having disastrous effects on aquatic life. Um, it's turning literally to, it, 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 yeah, it's having disastrous effects on aquatic life. Were you about life, to yeah. say it's turning the frogs gay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, it's true. It's, yeah. turning, it's turning the frogs gay. You know, <laughs> you know I, I, have, I have no kind of, I have no moral view on that, but, you know, it's obviously a problem as far as frogs, <laughs> frogs have, frogs making... You're not frogs homophobic against frogs. No, 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 just... I'm not, I'm not frog homophobic, but, you know, it's, it's obviously a problem when it comes to frogs making more frogs. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, that, I mean, these are, these are probably things that we should, that we should engage with, but this is, this is a conflict which I think is just... Um, people are just not willing to engage with at the moment. They're like, well, hopefully it's all going to be fine, so let's just not talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> what, a, what a note to end the interview on. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Mary. If people want to find you online, ironically, where is the best place to do that? My substack is Reactionary Feminist, mm -hmm. um, and I tweet at Moving Circles. Fabulous. Fantastic. And make sure also to check out Mary's work uh, on Unheard, which is absolutely brilliant. Mary, thank you for coming thank on. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you for watching at home or listening. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. We will see you very soon with another brilliant interview like this one or a Raw Show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. Or 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Which thank is the same time. It is the same time, but for our American guests. Guys, thank you so much and we'll see you soon.
We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our locals community using the link below.